Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCray. Since Yuri Gargarian, was that before you were born? I think so, That yeah. guy who took the first manned space flight in April of 1961, it was before you were born. Yes, yeah. it was. Humans have been fascinated, fascinated by space travel. Neil Armstrong, remember he walked on the moon in July of 1969? You, were you alive for that one? Yes. yes you were. <laughs> and since then, space programs have been looking to the next frontier. And believe it or not, you know what that is? Humans going to Mars. Wow. But a trip to the Red Planet uh, will indeed present problems for the astronauts, uh, not the least of which is how long it takes to get there. Mayo Clinic has been asked to study whether medically induced hypothermia, human hibernation... <laughs> What might yeah. help? I can't even believe it. Might help astronauts to endure the medical and logistical rigors of a journey that NASA hopes to launch less than two decades from now. Pretty here to exciting. Dis- yeah. Here to discuss is Mayo Clinic anesthesiologist Dr. Matthew Kumar. Dr. Kumar, it is great to meet you and welcome to the program. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. To you know, you, it seems like you're excited to be here, but in fact, you're excited to be anywhere, aren't you? So tell us about your, <laughs> your recent trip to India. Oh, Tom, you know, I've been going to India for the past 40 years. Every year I go, I take a bottle of DEET with me. You know, I, the mosquitoes Keep the bugs are a major up, yeah? problem. Yeah. This year I got too overconfident that nothing is going to happen to me and I didn't take a bottle of DEET. And I got bit by mosquitoes, real bad big mosquitoes. And I ended up getting dengue fever, dengue hemorrhagic fever. And really uh, took yeah, so we don't see that see, in the U.S. or maybe a, a case in Hawaii. Yeah, so yeah. It, tell us what happened. Uh, I mean, and I know it wasn't good, <laughs> <laughs> but you survived. Yes, I barely survived. I had renal failure, internal hemorrhage. Kidneys. Yeah. Yes, kidneys, and my uh, my platelet count dropped to 3,000. That's like no, you can't clot. I can't clot. I can't clot. Uh, so I was bleeding uh, internally, both in my stomach and in my lungs. Hold on just a second. I want you to just, you're scooching back because that's what you do in conversation. So go ahead, continue. <laughs> so, you know, I was bleeding internally. Um, um, it was encephalitis, so it's a high fever. So I was delirious for four days. Encephalitis meaning inflammation of the lining of the brain. Inflammation of the brain and the linings of the brain. (laughs) Uh, So I was totally delirious. And viral, so there's nothing you could do, just bear it. Just bear it. And, you know, it's a symptomatic treatment. They don't have a, they don't have an antibiotic that they can use. uh, They don't have a vaccine. Uh, So it's a... you know, it's God's grace that you survive. Or really? You don't. So, what percentage of, of people who get is it dengue? Is that how you pronounce yes, it? Yes, D E N G U E. Dengue, dengue fever, dengue, dengue, dengue fever. Okay. Okay. How many? Uh, what percentage survive? About uh, four, you know. I mean, 60, how lucky are you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you? You know, the mortality is somewhere between thirty-five and forty percent. Really? Yes. Yes. Uh, oh. If you have end organ failure, then it puts you. The mortality goes up to sixty to seventy percent. If, uh, you know, what I had, the renal failure along with uh, encephalitis, and I also had viral endocarditis. Every so that's the lining of the heart. Yes. And you oh. were here at Mayo <laughs> Clinic. You were in India. I I'm was not in saying India. that you weren't safe there, but I would <laughs> bet you might have thought, I wish I was at home. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I, British, I, I can't say British, I mean, the right. a- a- airlines wouldn't let me fly because they were afraid i was going to die in flight oh my gosh uh, they, really yes and they, well and now how long does this last and and how did they treat it what remember do, what this is not do? about dengue fever <laughs> <laughs> I know. we'll get to mars here shortly but i gotta hear about this i mean this is horrible uh, they put me in an icu and uh, you know there is no treatment other than just symptomatically giving me iv fluids and some food um, then eventually, you know, your body recovers and, you know, your immune system fights it back. Finally, huh? Um, yes. It yeah. took me two weeks. Well, I only know because last year Dr. Tosh told me in an interview, I think when you were gone, that there was some dengue fever in Hawaii and in the southeastern part of the United States. So it actually is not just in India. It is closer to home as well. I was surprised to know that. You know, yeah. I, I did a little bit of research on uh, dengue fever once I had the <laughs> fever. And, uh, you get it, can you get it? Twice? I, I think you could, but you know, you had developed active immunity, so well, you know, I would it think so. uh, you know, He's never going to travel without DEET no, again. No, no kidding. Spread and you know what? On. If you go to Mars, do you think that you need to take DEET with you? Is that something to con- be <laughs> I concerned I think I about? would. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us about how you got interested in uh, in this. I mean, you're an anesthesiologist, yes, but yet you're talking about Mars. So, how are you involved with this? Well, you know, 
one of my research aspects is uh, therapeutic hypothermia, you know, lowering the body temperature as a therapeutic modality for uh, treating cardiac arrest or for patients with stroke or with somebody So a stroke with or heart attack, you're lowering the body temperature because the survival is better? Survival is much better. You protect the neurons, you know, once your metabolic rate goes down. Neurons, that's like the brain. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you remember, I'm a bone doctor, and we're talking to the lay public here. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, it's got enormous neuroprotective effects, uh, hypothermia, just dropping the body temperature by about 5 to 6 degrees centigrade. You know, you achieve uh, pretty good neuronal protection. There is nothing out there that can do that. Uh, you know, if you completely cool the body down to about 16 or 18 degrees C, you can stop the heart for about an hour, you know, oh total gosh. circulatory arrest uh, for about an hour. So, you know, hypothermia is a very effective neuroprotectant. That's the one thing that brain, we know for neuro. sure. You, for when the you brain say neuro, you mean brain. Okay. Yes. So my interest, basic, uh, my basic scientific curiosity is more in terms of therapeutic hypothermia. You know, we have been studying uh, therapeutic hypothermia in pigs following traumatic brain injury. Uh, for the past five or six years, and then prior to that in humans, you know, observing how what happens with hypothermia. So when we got called, you know, by some of the co-investigators, they wanted to see if we can induce hibernation, which is very similar to therapeutic hypothermia, um, in astronauts who are traveling to Mars, you know. So it kind of dovetails nicely, therapeutic hypothermia and hibernation. Because if you look at a bear, it's a hibernating bear, it's very similar to therapeutic hypothermia. You know, the body temperature drops down to about 30 C or 32 C, and the heart rate goes down and respirations go down, and the animal sleeps for about six months without eating or peeing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or urinating. And, um, but so hypothermia, I just, I'm not a medical doctor here, but I just know that it's not good. So is it specifically very carefully managing the hypothermia that makes it okay to even have this conversation? Correct. Okay. It's not just the accidental hypothermia could be dangerous, obviously. Sure. Uh, but, you know, controlled hypothermia, therapeutic hypothermia, you know, controlling it and keeping it in a narrow range of somewhere between 28C and 32C seems to have all the beneficial effects without the deleterious effects of hypothermia. If your core body temperature drops below 28 you start having cardiac arrhythmias, which could kill you. So you really don't want your heart, core body temperature to drop below 28. So you keep it in that narrow range. You achieve the benefits without the side effects. So uh, the idea is if you can get the astronauts to hibernate, hibernate or you get them hypothermic, they'll be easier, it'll be better for them, easier for them to make the trip? Yes. You know, we... we at least one of the hypotheses that we are proposing is, you know, put them in hibernation. Not for the entire trip, but maybe part of the trip. You know, you, you cycle them. You know, there are nine astronauts. <laughs> they go to sleep for three weeks, then they wake up, and then the next crew goes into hibernation torpor, and then you wake them up after three weeks. And so we kind of cycle them. You maybe, can do that? Yes. Yes. Really? What about through January, <laughs> there February, weeks that and I'd March? Like to miss. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, so uh, you're working in collaboration with NASA. Is this? Are they excited about the work that you're doing? They are. They are excited, and we are totally excited. You know, we got some great team uh, working on this. You know, I got Dr. Kelly Drew from uh, Alaska, or even Toyn from. Uh, Alaska to Center for Arctic Studies. So it's, it's just a phenomenal group of people. And I got Dr. Uh, um, Alexander Rabenstein here from Mayo, a neurologist. So we got a great team and we are looking at it. And I think it's, it's I, we believe it's almost necessary. You know, if you're gonna travel yeah. for 253 days to reach Mars, it's gonna be a lot difficult to stay in a confined small capsule with nine other people. Yeah, interesting. Dr. Matthew Kumar, he's an anesthesiologist at the Mayo Clinic, and he's also an expert on human hibernation, and we got to hear more about this. And when we come back, we'll ask him, you know, how far is it to Mars? I guess he said it takes 253 yeah. days to get there, and why would anybody want to go? <laughs> Time for a short break. You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. 
Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We are with anesthesiologist Dr. Matthew Kumar, a survivor of a dengue fever and now <laughs> working. On, yeah, I'm, I'm still amazed about that. 35, 40% of people die if they get this disease. That's correct. This oh, is a very so confusing glad. conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dengue fever I and know, hibernation. I know, but how can you just not talk about that? Too? I, You know, maybe you ought to just stay home next year. <laughs> I'll pray to the good Lord. That's yeah. good. All right, so when it comes to to um, sending humans to Mars. It's over 250 days to do so, and it's boring, I guess, a uh, long ways to go. And what would be the benefit of hibernating, uh, aside from you get a lot of reading done or watch a lot of movies? What's the benefit of having those astronauts in hibernation instead of just sitting for 250 days? Tracy, great question. Hibernation has got two components. One is the observable thing that's sleep. You know, they're sleeping. They're not awake. And the second is the hypothermia, you know, lowering the body temperature. The sleep has a couple of benefits here. One is it immobilizes the astronaut, so they're confined in a pod, hibernation pod, where they're sleeping. So it right away negates the need for activities of daily living. That's like, you know, you have to, every day if you're awake, you have to bathe, you, you need to space. shave, you need to brush your teeth, you need to do, you know, cook, change your clothing. All the activities of daily living come to a halt right there if they're sleeping. The second is you don't have to um, have things to keep yourself busy. There is no uh, you know, need for recreation. You don't have to give this person an exercise machine or TV or something else to keep them busy. Third important component is conflict, interpersonal conflict. Oh. If you remember the Biosphere 2 experiments. Are there women going on this? <laughs> hey, no, wait. I am planning my summer vacation road trip with my family right now, and all of a sudden this is starting to make a lot more sense. <laughs> the, the third component is interpersonal conflicts. They are a major issue. If you combine people in a confined space, sooner or later fights erupt. They start getting in each other's space, and, you know, it, uh, it becomes a problem, yeah. a serious problem. Okay. Biosphere 2, that was the number one reason why they just couldn't stand each other you know one of the experiments that they oh, had wow. uh, so i think if they're sleeping you don't have to deal with all of those issues okay now tell me this what uh, is the benefit of going into hibernation are you do you slow down the aging process do you slow down your metas metabolism what's happening the second component that's the first component was the sleep and the second component is the hypothermia with hypothermia yes you know your body metabolic rate comes down it comes down about seven to eight percent for each one degree drop in body temperature. So if you drop your body temperature, normal body temperature being about 37, if you bring it down to 32, you're right there, you got about 40 percent reduction in your basal metabolic rate. So you need less oxygen, you need to carry less amount of oxygen, less amount of food. You know, those things are pretty good. In addition to reduction in your oxygen and you know metabolic requirements. You also have benefit of hypothermia in terms of reducing the intracranial pressure, which is a major issue. So that's the pressure inside your brain? Inside your brain, cranium. inside your yep. skull. Mm -hmm. um, one of the major complications is blindness, which apparently happens as a result of optic nerve neuropathy, the compression caused by a rise in intracranial pressure hmm. occurring at the point where the optic nerve goes through the hole in the brain to the eyes. So optic nerve neuropathy and blindness can be reduced by reducing the intracranial pressure. So this hypothermia thing has got lots of benefits, as I said, in reduction in oxygen, food, and also reduction in intracranial pressures. Is it harmful to your body to be in hibernation, to be, <laughs> to have Doesn't hypothermia like going <laughs> on, if it's carefully managed? <laughs> Again, an excellent question. You know, hypothermia itself is, we're just starting to understand more about hypothermia. You know, there is lots of unknowns and there's lots of problems with hypothermia. We have tried to keep uh, pigs, for example, hypothermic for a protracted period of time. Two of the major issues with hypothermia are, one is infection. You know, infection because your immune system is suppressed along with the other parts of your body. So infection becomes a major problem. Two is, even though hypothermia causes uh, coagulopathy, you know, blood doesn't clot very well, eventually you start getting DVTs and then pulmonary embolism. Blood clots. Blood clots. Okay. Uh, uh, that kills the animal. So, you know, if you have difficulty, it, it rises exponentially after about five or six days, at least in the pigs, we see these animals dying as a result of possibly either infection or as a result of uh, deep venous thrombosis. 
and then ultimately blood clots, pee, yeah. blood clots. Okay, so now we want to know how you do this. I mean, it seems to me like you're going to have to load an awful lot of ice on that uh, spaceship. <laughs> I mean, how do, you, how do you make someone hypothermic? Excellent question, Tom. You know, we had a fantastic breakthrough study here right in uh, Rochester last summer. I had Dr. Kelly Drew from uh, Arctic Center in Alaska, Fairbanks, along with uh, Dr. Oyvind Toya. That's a Norwegian name. Oyvind, if you're listening, uh, sorry I'm butchering your name. (laughs) Oyvind (laughs) Toya. That sounds pretty good. (laughs) He's a Norwegian uh, scientist. So we, we came here and we did, for the first time, it's a real breakthrough. We have been able to induce a hibernation like state in a non hibernating mammal, such as a pig. Uh, the, 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 the finding is just uh, phenomenal in terms of, uh, you know, until now we couldn't do it. You know, we cannot induce hibernation in a non hibernating mammal, so mm-hmm. yeah, such as a pig or a dog. By using certain chemicals, you know, we used um, N6 uh, CHA, cyclohexyl adenosine, and then using some other chemicals to prevent the side effects of this chemical, we have been able to stop intrinsic thermogenesis and shivering thermogenesis in these animals. Shivering thermogenesis is a major issue. So uh, tell us what that means. Every time your core body temperature drops below 36.5 or you know, like centigrade. Yeah. Most of my life. <laughs> <laughs> cold all the I'm time. I'm always cold. Yeah. <laughs> you start shivering, and then there is a sympathetic activity that triggers a non-shivering thermogenesis. So that's common to all euthermic animals. You know, all Thermogenesis, us, meaning your body tries to warm you up. Body tries to, yes, yeah. warm, okay. warm you up, either okay. by shivering or by uh, production of more uh, uh, intrinsic heat. So we have now a technology to stop that intrinsic fight back that every mammal has uh, to bring the temperature back to 37. So we have been able to do that for the first time. So we almost have a chemical that can stop the intrinsic fight back or the pushback that the body does. So we can easily induce hypothermia now with these chemicals. Wow, incredible. So uh, you're working with NASA, is that right? Yep. And, and they're serious about this. They actually want somebody to go, why do, why do we want to go to Mars? Uh, just to f- that's the next frontier, Tom. You know, we don't have, uh, you know, that's an excellent question. Uh, you know, that's human destiny. You know, we don't have uh, enough space here on Earth. Sooner or later, you know. Exploring. Na- yes, mm-hmm. exploration is in our blood. You know, NASA has got the timeline. That's, you know, they want to send somebody by 2030 or mid-2030s. You think they'll make it? I think they'll make it. I'm, I'm excited. I'm completely, totally sold on this. <laughs> because in my lifetime, I'm going to see somebody, a fellow human, land on Mars. That's just incredible. It is incredible. It's how many miles? Oh, it's got 34.9 million miles, or 35 million miles. So it's pretty far Basically away. Basically like my summer vacation. Yeah. <laughs> 253 days. <laughs> we could put you into hibernation. It'll be the best trip you've it ever had. It actually sounds like a dream you're <laughs> aging, and you know, when you wake up, you'll be right there. I you drive, it. honey. I'm hibernating. Hey, it's the yeah. Grand Canyon. <laughs> Dr. Matthew Kumar, he's an anesthesiologist and an expert on human hibernation and hypothermia. We're glad you're alive and we're glad you're here. Thanks so much for being with us. It's awesome. Great to be with you. Thank you, Matthew.